Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about accommodations at school and work for ADHD. Um, as in past weeks, I'm going to be talking probably for 15 or 20 minutes. If you have questions while I'm talking, you can certainly type them in here on Facebook. And this video will be posted both on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, next week, I will not be talking live, so hopefully you and I and everyone else can be enjoying Thanksgiving. So I'll start with the accommodations are usually defined as measures that either a school, a teacher, a workplace, a testing situation, your boss makes to minimize the functional impairment that are caused by the condition, in this case ADHD, and that theoretically that these same um, changes would not benefit or affect someone who is not disabled or affected by the same condition. Um, that second part is often not rigorously examined or looked at or even a necessary part of accommodation, but that is, is sort of the intent or purpose of the accommodation. It's not to give someone an advantage over others, it's to bring them up to a standard level of performance. And yes, we can get into a philosophical discussion as to whether societal standards are ideal for everyone or whether we should be having more individualized goals, but I'm not going to get into that now. The second big point I'm going to make is that most of the research that there is has been done, as, as with many of the subtopics within ADHD, have been done, done on children, and that means these are accommodations in the school place. Um, most of my work and focus is with adults, and therefore most of the time I certainly work with students, both young adults and people who go back later in life, but um, more often I'm coming up with this in the workplace situation. So examples of the commonest um, accommodations that are both offered and that have been studied uh, there's a handful of things. The commonest one by far is offering kids in a school situation extended time to complete test situations, sometimes extended time to complete homework or other assignments. Um, probably the second one is ways of reducing distraction by altering the settings. So either putting kids in smaller classrooms, putting uh, student's chair closer to the teacher, um, particularly for testing situations. That can even be putting kids in an individual room free of distractions, auditory and visual, supposedly. Um, other forms of accommodations in the school situation would be having small group instructions um, or small group for testing situations. Um, also, uh, Another one is providing oral presentation of information that would normally just be given in a written format. And although I hadn't seen many studies on it, I'd also posit the opposite, particularly in college situations, providing written information when it's only orally presented to others. So a very common one in college situations is to have um, written lecture notes for students with ADHD rather than having them just or only attending the um, auditory or formal presentation by the teacher. Um, two other accommodations that have been studied frequently for kids with ADHD have been having more frequent breaks, so particularly again during a testing situation, but also during a lecture um, presentation situation, allowing um, <clears throat> more interruption instead of having big, long stretches of time. And then the last one is the use of calculators. Now, again, theoretically, many of these have been designed or offered knowing what the deficits in executive functioning that are caused by attention, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So we know there are problems not just with um, paying attention, but with switching attention, with sustaining attention, with time management, with prioritizing, with planning. Um, 
And again, many of these accommodations were designed to help mitigate that. The formal testing on how effective these accommodations are has been very mixed. And I'd say there's very little hard data, I'm not saying none, that any of these accommodations are overwhelmingly effective. And interestingly, again, getting back to how I defined or how others have defined accommodations, in almost all the testing that I'm familiar with are formally looking at whether these accommodations helped kids with ADHD. Um, in almost all cases, they helped people without ADHD to a greater extent. So giving more time helped people without ADHD more than it helped people with ADHD. And again, that one is reasonable to think is a situation. One of the things I tell my people I work with who have ADHD is that free time is their enemy. That if you're given a huge expanse of time, people with ADHD have a harder time structuring it, using it effectively, and often further away, greater amounts of time. So actually deadlines are often helpful and shorter periods of time may be helpful. Um, so again, there are certainly other learning disabilities are disproportionately found among individuals with ADHD. And certainly for some of those specific dyslexia, other reading conditions, other accommodations have been measurably and consistently found to be helpful. But, but the overall research literature so far has not shown overwhelming, again, benefit for the ADD individual with ADD from any of these accommodations. Um, so I'm going to move a little over to the workplace situation. Again, there's much less of a research base, so much of this is going to be more my own experience working with adults. And I'm going to start with my strong preference, rather than calling these accommodations, is to label them efficiencies. And why I'm saying that is the term accommodation, both often by the employer, certainly by coworkers who aren't receiving it, and often the individuals themselves who's receiving it, an accommodation is, sounds like it's asking for a handout. It's asking for a special gift or a consideration or a loosening or restriction of rules that is special for you. Um, and it also often feels like an imposition, a concession, or something's being extracted or sacrificed on the part of the employer, which is not something they're particularly delighted to give. One thing I will back up and say is that the topic of accommodations is actually very explicitly and clearly addressed in the federal um, Americans with Disabilities Act that um, the senior George Bush signed into office when he was president um, before the turn of this millennium. Many states, including where I work in California, also have state level disability acts and separate from how they define the disabilities and set up rules and regulations, almost all of these state and federal laws include the requirement that employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities to help them perform their job duties adequately. Um, that doesn't mean employers are required to hire people who are unable to do their jobs, but that if you're in a job situation, um, you are allowed to ask for reasonable accommodations. Um, I said many of these laws are clear. What's not so clear always is how you define the term reasonable, because what's reasonable to one person may not be reasonable to another. But again, getting back to particularly if you are an employee asking for accommodations, I would try to frame it in terms of efficiencies. And what I mean by efficiencies is what is being changed, what is being um, granted to you is a change in rules, a change in regulations, a change in structure that is allowing you to perform better. And that is not just an advantage to you as an individual working for this company or on this team, but that's an advantage to your whole team. It's a whole advantage to your company. Your company should want you to perform better or up to your optimal abilities. You should hopefully want you to perform that way. Um, and, and these 
changes in regulations, changes in structure, changes in whatever is happening, again, are helping you to be more efficient in that given situation than the given situation would allow you without those changes. So that's why I label them efficiencies. And I think it's a useful way to think of it as if you are the person in need of asking it for your employer. And that's a useful idea to inculcate into your employer and to your coworkers that that's what this is about. So in the general workplace situation, the, the number one um, request among students for extended time, sometimes that's a possibility. Oftentimes in the workplace, that's one of the things that isn't flexible, that if the team's working on a project, your part of it has to happen in accordance with the others. So I do not as often hear that as a specific request. Um, so much more I'm hearing about requests for wasting either increased structure to help um, monitor, check in, regulate the person with ADHD to help make sure they're staying on task or approaches that help reduce the demands and the demands are not in the core requirements of the job, but these are in largely the paperwork distractions that have been seemingly added exponentially in the modern workplace. Although the paperwork showing that you've done the work when and hopefully computers and systems will improve in this regard in the years ahead. Hopefully we will develop more and more systems that help monitor what you've done and record what you've done without that becoming an additional step as it so often is now where you have to check in um, forms or check in boxes or write up reports to document what you've already done. Hopefully we will develop more efficient systems for everyone where Part of you actually doing the work is recording the work without making that recording an additional task. So one of the most common requests I've had patients request for their workplaces is to find, create situations that are less distracting. So some of those are requests to be able to wear noise canceling headphones in a communal open cubicle type framework or office setting. Um, sometimes if the office, you know, permits it or there's enough space, this an accommodation may be to give a person a office with a lock, not a locked door, but a, a door on it rather than an open space cubicle. And again, the, the concept is people with ADHD are more susceptible to distractions and particularly auditory distractions, but also visual distractions in open workplace. So some of the ways to mitigate that in an open workplace I've had people get special permission just to be able to turn their chair so their back is to most of their coworkers. And again, that's not because they're antisocial, it's because they know they are distracted by that. Um, uh, so that's some of the structural ways I've had people successfully ask for accommodations. Another one is asking for more structure is, uh, to help stay on track is, re is requesting more either benchmarks or feedback or check-ins with a manager or supervisor um, so that the order is to break down a larger task into smaller tasks and to help make sure that you are staying in, on track with those tasks. And again, if you present it that this is just an accommodation, I'm asking you, Mr. Manager, or Ms. Boss, to do extra work by meeting me with more frequently. The way to frame it is that this is going to help me be on track. It's going to help me perform in circuit and synchrony with the whole team. And I'm going to be more productive, get more done in the time that's allotted. And my project will be in sync with everyone else's. So again, it should ideally and probably the investment in time of making sure you are on track ideally would be less time overall than that manager or supervisor spends in tracking you down, dealing with delayed or missed items or other things like that that can happen with a person with ADHD getting off track. Um, so there are certainly, again, the whole emphasis of accommodations or efficiencies is not to, to diminish the demands on you in terms of performing the product or the core um, essence of your job description, it's to reduce, again, peripheral paperwork items um, that may not be necessary and or to reduce 
barriers or to create structures that help you perform more efficiently. So what are some of, so people often ask me, should I be asked, you know, I don't want to ask for accommodations. That's going to um, mark me as a troublemaker, mark me as a problematic worker. And what I say, first of all, is this is always an individualized issue. So I don't have any blanket rules that, yes, if you have ADHD, you should always demand them accommodations on the first day you're there, or you should never mention anything to anybody. This is always an individual situation based on your own abilities, based on your other strengths, based on how much ADHD is interfering with specific tasks, based on what you know about how your manager or workplace is likely to deal with things. Um, but it highlights, so I'll go into it, you know, there are a couple of drawbacks of asking for accommodations. I mean, one is that even though explicitly in federal law and explicitly in most state laws, including California's, the employer isn't allowed to discriminate against you for having a disability or for asking for accommodations. At some levels and in, in, in some in, in violation of the law or in some ways skirting or so circuitously working with the law, sometimes people who get accommodations are discriminated against. Sometimes people with, um, with identified disabilities are discriminated against and there is stigma which is negative viewpoints held by coworkers or bosses or the person's own internalized stigma. You know, many people with ADHD feel they should be able to buck up and meet the standards of other people in these measures and they stigmatize themselves as being weak or defective or wrong. Even if they know that ADHD is an explanation, they're afraid they may be using it as an excuse. So there's issues of both stigma and discrimination that can be brought up by the topic of accommodations. And the other related to this, but I'd say subtly different, is the issue of resentment or jealousy. Again, particularly if this is framed as an accommodation, as a concession rather than an efficiency, other people may resent, you know, why does she get to her own private office? Why does he get to wear headphones when everyone else has to be exposed to the ringing phones and other noise in the common area? Again, if you frame it in terms of why this helps your specific, mitigate your specific disability or um, problematic areas and perform at a better level, that can help both your coworkers and you and your bosses understand it more efficiently. A related issue, which I'm only going to touch on a topic, is one of the other things to be aware of is that some of what may cause difficulties in the workplace, and particularly getting back to students and testing situations, yes, ADHD may itself affect performance and test situations, but maybe more often, or I don't know, frequency or how we parse this out, but very often anxiety about ADHD or knowing that ADHD has led you to daydream or use time inefficiently and knowing that that impairs your testing performance or job performance or presentation performance can add to anxiety. And it can be often that the anxiety is a bigger piece of the puzzle than the ADHD in terms of impairing in performance. And if that's so, that's important to identify because there's different strategies, either psycho, um, psychotherapeutically or psychopharmacologically that can help address anxiety. And I've also seen the opposite situation. I've seen people who's got to middle ages and even older where it had only been identified that they had problems with anxiety, including in test situations, presentation situations, when fundamentally ADHD was their primary problem and again, the anxiety was there in the manifestation in certain situations, but that the ADHD itself had been missed or neglected. So that's about all I'm gonna say on that topic. I do see there's at least one question here. So I'm gonna be answering that. And again, you can write in more questions while I'm talking. So, the question is, I've come across a situation where a mid-level manager shared with me in private that they think I have ADHD and that I don't pay attention to details. I responded by acknowledging their observation. What would you recommend I say on top of that? So again, it, it comes to the issue of there are very strong legal protections against discrimination. And it, again, I, I, 
I'm not going to make blanket generalizations, but almost always you are in a stronger position if you acknowledge, yes, I have ADHD. Yes, it's been identified by a health professional. Yes, I am working to mitigate problems from it. And yes, if you are seeing symptoms of it in the workplace, um, I'd appreciate these additional ways of efficiencies so we can work together so I can lessen any negative impact this may be having. Um, so I think that's, again, there, there may be specifics of an individual situation where that's not wise or that's not helpful, but again, particularly if other people are already noticing things that they are deeming problematic, you are almost always better in a stronger position acknowledging, yes, I am aware this is a condition, because once you've publicly acknowledged that to a manager or supervisor, they are legally required to acknowledge this in your workplace evaluations, and they are legally required to work with you on reasonable accommodations. Again, there may be differences in, in what they determine is reasonable, but you are in a much stronger position. So I, I have seen people who had ADHD who tried to hide it from their employers and were not successful in it and wound up getting fired for things that were clearly attributable to their ADHD symptoms and they had little legal recourse. I've had the opposite situation at least twice where people um, did have problematic aspects of their job performance because of their ADHD. They identified their ADHD. They were discriminated against or not given appropriate accommodations and lost or were demoted and actually successfully sued their employers because again it's not legal to be discriminating against people in our society at this point in time so again generally acknowledging it to people who have managerial um, power over you or to hr gives you legal protections that may not be there otherwise so that's about all for today. Again, next week, I will not be here talking because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I'm actually actively soliciting and will probably be sending out a questionnaire seeking what topics would be interesting to you for me to talk about in the generally anywhere in the ADHD, adult ADHD realm. Um, one of my thoughts is to look at more recent scientific articles that have been published and sort of give my take on why they're relevant or why they're hyped, overly hyped or what relevance or meaning this might have to either our understanding about ADHD or our, our ways of managing or helping, helping or coping with ADHD. So um, have a safe and sane Thanksgiving and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>